and uh, students who are taking history classes. And so uh, whether you're here by force or by choice, we're happy to have you. Uh, good evening. Um, I guess I'm serving as a moderator of sorts. I'm Dr. Christopher Curry. I once was the chair of the School of Social Science. Now I'm simply Associate Professor of History here at UB. Tonight's event is looking at WTO from a different perspective. We're so happy that you're here. We have three panelists that I'm sure will be engaging. Uh, we have, first of all, Dr. Din Din Dinothra. Din Help me out. Dinothra. Dr. Dinothra Archer Cartwright. She is going to provide sort of a broad brushstroke of WTO and some of the challenges that it presents to us. She will be followed by myself. I'm going to be looking at the non-discriminatory clause of the WTO and what that actually means. And then our third speaker for tonight is Keisha Ellis. She is an adjunct professor in political science at the University of the Bahamas. And I think she's looking largely at food security and some other issues related to WTO. So you're not going to get three pre present presentations that are all the same. Each of us is going to be tackling a particular issue related to WTO. One of the things that we hope to do tonight is to have an interactive session after we've done our brief presentations, because we understand that educating requires all of us to have a dialogue and a conversation. And without further ado, I would say one last thing before we get started. There are bathroom facilities. If you go down this hall to your right and then take a left, they're both, of course, men and women's rooms. And the other thing I was told is Ms. Brister, who manages this facility, does not want anyone to eat or drink in this auditorium. So those are the rules of engagement. Let's have a wonderful time tonight as I bring on uh, Dr. Archer Cartwright. Much easier for me to pronounce. <laughs> Hello, good day, everyone. Good day. Dr. Denosa Archer I am actually a family physician, so a medical specialist. So why am I talking about trade? Oh. Well, um, this is a topic basically, um, I've been kind of in society uh, civil groups for the last uh, two years or so, starting with Citizens Against uh, Bank Exploitation, which we looked at the banking industry and how uh, that was affecting the humans. And then we needed a broader voice. So Voice of the People basically is a nonprofit where we're looking at advocacy and how do we tackle these different um, things that are happening in the country uh, by educating um, and community building. So that's, that's where that all comes from. So today I'm going a, a little bit broad. This is a longer presentation, but I'm gonna go through it a little bit quicker so you just get an idea. So everyone has an understanding of what the WTO really is because this is something that's happening in the country and uh, we're moving full steam ahead. So you should kind of have an idea and use this as a jump off to study and look into other things. Right, so we're kind of going through these things. And, um, Oh, sorry, they're telling me the light. There you go, so you might better. Okay. <laughs> we do have a six year old in the audience, so let's see. All right, uh, so just maybe put out there this was a quote that I saw about friends and affairs information. Trade deals cannot be discussed in secret. Locking people out of the WTO further threatens its legitimacy, and we'll see what that's all about as we go along. And so just a little bit of background about the history of the World Trade Organization. Uh, basically, uh, the world after World War II and a lot of things were happening, they started having these agreements because people were fighting over trading. And so they started off with the GATT, uh, the G-A-T-T, -T, the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade. And uh, that pretty much kept things stable for a while, but they thought they needed something better, so they started looking into other organizations like the ITO, and then eventually in 1995, they replaced all of that with what we call the World Trade Organization. So the World Trade Organization is the only global international organization dealing with the rules of trade between nations. Um, at the heart of it, the WTO agreements and negotiations are signed by the bulk of the world's trading nations and ratified in their parliaments. The goal is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly and predictably and freely as possible. That's straight from the from the WTO itself. So that's how they define themselves. And so this is the gentleman who is in charge. His name is Robert Azevedo, and they're uh, they're residing in Switzerland, Geneva. There's 164 members. Those members all uh, represent a different country. 
So what makes the WTO so different from the other trade agreements in the past? There's some key things. The WTO uh, agreement, they're, they're basically permanent. And why I say that is because it's very difficult to get out. I don't know anyone who's been able to get out. Uh, there's an application process, but remember, it's taken us 18 years to get here. How long do you think it takes to get out of? No one's ever gotten out. Uh, the members are actually countries, and uh, the WTO is more powerful than the GATT because the settlement mechanism is faster, more efficient, and very difficult to block the rulings. So they, um, they actually, the rulings within the WTO uh, are supposed to be a stronger thing. The other big thing about the WTO is that the rules of the WTO have to be implemented into your laws. So that is a big thing that has made it a lot different from the other trade agreements because you not only have to agree to this, you also have to agree to change your laws and your policies in order to be a part of the WTO. And they basically do all of this by a ministerial conference that happens every two years, so that makes all the decisions. If you look at a, a book written uh, called The Trade Liberalization and the WTO and Impacts on Agriculture and Farming, you found that the WTO is considered an instrument of globalization, marketization, and recolonization. Uh, it is used for exploitation and marginalization of the poor, and it is used by multilateral corporations in their quest for profits. So big business really pushes the agenda for the WTO, and it's their interests, basically, that are, are dealt with, uh, and you see that later as we go through this. Um, and basically, like I mentioned, the national laws of the country basically have to change, and these favor foreign companies or international companies over the local people. And so we have been changing laws. So we've been changing laws and using this idea of uh, liberalization and, and, and markets for the last 18 years since we've been moving towards the WTO. And so we have been changing laws over the years uh, in order to it. You've been hearing a lot about what we call the e-procurement. And we say it sounds very good, it looks beautiful on paper. This comes straight from the WTO. So we can see that we have been changing our laws and our policies in order to fall in line with this particular organization. So it's important to know that uh, the laws and the things that we're changing in our society have to do with joining. So government procurement is very important, and that's why the e-procurement system has been put in place, because that also gives access to people internationally to uh, secure uh, contracts within the country. And so you have to have these things in place before you join the organization. I want to mention also that there are four modes of supply of services recognized by the WTO. Your coarse water supply, which uh, your consumption abroad, commercial presence, and movements of natural persons. And they call this the four modes of supply and services. And what cross border means is that you can sell across the border, you can send things from one place to another, you can um, do it like that. You can go abroad to another person's country and you can buy something and bring it back. You can have a business within the country that signs on. And then what we have here is the movement of natural person, which means that these companies can now bring persons to work um, and reside in your, in your country or the country uh, that has signed on to WTO by means of trade. And as you can see, I mentioned the CEB bill, which is now the CEB Act, which is the Commercial Enterprise Act, which is a bill we put in place to make it easier for people to bring their people with them when they set up a company. And so you can see we are following, falling in line with all of this. Uh, one of the big principles of the WTO is the most favored nation treatment, which basically means that whatever treatment you give to one country, you have to give to us 164. So up until this time, we were able to trade with whoever we want and tell, tell certain people no. Once we joined the WTO, all of those 164 countries, they're basically like the same person and we have to give them whatever we would give special attention to whoever we want. Uh, so that changes. You've heard this word called ascension. It's basically the process of getting through into the WTO. And it follows this model where you kind of work on what the trade agreement would be, and within that there are different levels of bilateral, multilateral, and plurilateral uh, 
crossings that happen. So you're making different agreements within an agreement. So it gets very, very complicated. So it's not as simple as they say where we just go in the sign and this trade. There's a lot of different things that are going on. Uh, I guess Keisha will come into this, but this one of these side agreements also has to do with our agriculture. So when they speak to agriculture not being a part of it, that is not exactly true because there are different agreements that branch off of this main agreement. And so this is why we have to kind of start looking at this and knowing exactly um, how this is going to affect us because it can in so many ways. This is us. This is when we decided to go back to the WTO after 17 years and sign back up to say that we want to be a part of this process and they put us back onto the rotation of a session and we are moving full steam ahead. Uh, these documents, you can't see them clearly, but this is just to let you know that you can go straight to the WTO website and kind of follow our session process. And as you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see well, but they have our trade value is 0%. It's so small uh, because they count uh, anything at less than 0.015% of trade globally as, you know, small nations. And ours is so minuscule, they didn't even count it. And so why are we getting into a trade game and we don't have any trade. Um, <laughs> we, don't have, we have very little trade. Uh, we have a trade deficit of over a billion dollars, so that means we buy more uh, than we sell. And so right now we are consumers, so that makes us a very ripe market for 164 nations to sell their goods. But we are not really selling anything because the major part of our trade is actually service trade, which is tourism and services, financial services. That is something that we've always been doing. So unless we have a great plan on how to increase our services and trade, we're not really trading anything. And so we, they talk about the pros and the cons, but when we look at the pros and the cons, we find that they can, the, what they call pros are not pros at all. And uh, the, the overall impact of what was found, because they say you'll have more jobs, more FDI, increased economic growth, but we've been seeing um, more FDI, more foreign direct investment over the years, but we have not been seeing the impact of this. So uh, this doesn't really turn out to be what we need it to be. And if we look at this graph in the corner that comes straight from the WTO website, you can see that uh, the unemployment rate in those countries basically stayed the same or actually increased over time rather than giving them the type of growth that they expected. So, you know, they're selling to you an idea that this is going to grow your country, it's going to increase in employment, but those numbers actually don't pan out, and this comes straight from their website. So, uh, these improvements that they talk about, like look at a country like Jamaica. So they've had an increase recently and they've been minimum wage $7,000 per week. Sounds like a lot. It's an increase of about $5. So they went from about $45 to about $50. But at the same time, the WTO's partner, the IMF, uh, actually pushed for them to have a downgrade in their money. So they're, they're now devalued to $135 to $1. And so, and, and, and what they said to them is, this is good for you because now you can compete better with with Mexico in terms of your trade, so your money is less, and so people can buy more from you. If you look a little bit closer at Jamaica, you can find that um, the minute they joined the GATT, which was the origins of the WTO, they lost all their preferential treatments. So they had preferential treatments with Europe because they were uh, Commonwealth countries, post-Commonwealth countries, and they were able to sell their stuff, you know? The Europeans were like, we'll buy your bananas, we'll buy your stuff. They join the gap, and instantly America comes in, challenges them by the WTO rules, because you've signed up to their international rules, and says, this is not fair, we want in on the banana trade, even though nobody in America really grows bananas, but there are some companies that are linked to America that do sell bananas, so you now have to make this a level playing field for them. So they actually lost. They actually lost quite a bit. And so uh, they lost their preference, and the US turned around and made their own deals where they pick and select who they're going to give preferential treatment to. The increase in low income jobs was very short lived, and um, as they found income, um, 
ex importing or importing was not their uh, focus. Exporting was not their focus, just like us. So they didn't get most of their income from exports. So they found that all of these things that they said that they were going to benefit from, it didn't really happen. Um, they actually ended up with an increased reliance on importing goods, um, and uh, they the increase was they also had an increase in the cost of living due to GCT. That's like our VAT. So what they actually ended up with is importing more goods because they weren't competing well anymore, so they weren't exporting their stuff. They actually started importing more things, and then their cost of living actually went up because they had to they had taxes like VAT, which in, increase the costs exponentially. So they had a contraction in their exports and their imports, and they never attained the growth that they were promised, and there was stagnation in the economy and growth, and of course the U.S. continued to use the W-2 and the IMF, and which leads now to further devaluation of their money, and they are not as competitive as they were before they joined. So it didn't look that good for Jamaica. They're right down the street from us, I like to say which Caribbean nation would we like to trade places with? We are the only ones who are not in the WTO, so we should think about that. There's also this concept called churn, which is a creative destruction. And this comes straight from the WTO website, and they basically suggest to governments that uh, they have to have support systems in place in order to protect their workers from job losses. So there should be training going on right now as we see or we're ascending to the WTO. We should be training our people uh, and, and finding them new sources and um, skills because the WTO itself says, guess what? Some people are going to lose their job and you should be prepared for that. We're not having that as a discussion. There are other cons, of course. You have job outsourcing and we're seeing this now because we've been introducing these policies over the last 18 years. And for you young Bahamians who are looking for jobs and you see that the really good jobs are, are going to people who are outside of the country or being brought into the country, here you have it, outsourcing of jobs. Uh, uh, the, the WTO itself is undemocratic because the way that they uh, make decisions is by consensus. So if you know anything about the cabinet of the Bahamas, they also make their decisions by consensus. They go in a room, Someone says, blah, 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 blah. Everybody has to go in and then they all bang on the table. So that's the same thing, except now you have 164 countries who all have to come to some sort of form of consensus without a vote. And so these are the people who will now be making the decisions on your behalf, all right? Um, the taxes will be reduced at the border, so we have to find uh, where that money is gonna be coming from. And of course, it hinders development in developing nations. Because you are now having to compete with countries who have developed over time, who have secured ways of having making cheaper products, who have uh, persons who work for less, uh, it hinders development in developing nations because you lose your competitive edge and therefore you usually have to close up shop. So there are a lot of different cons on there. I won't go through all of them. Um, also, there have been issues with uh, trampling of labor and human rights. Uh, the WTO is considered a race to the bottom for workers. Um, it's illegal to ban products based on production, and the rules against non-commercial values are higher than human rights. So commercial rights tend to trump human rights. They deregulate industries, logging, fishing, and we are big with the fishing thing here. Um, you hear them talking about bringing in pelagic fishing, uh, where are these concepts coming from? Well, that's when you liberalize these particular areas. The rules that they had on Bahamians, uh, the rest of the world doesn't want to be restricted in the way that they fish in your waters. And so you would have to start opening some of these things up. And whether it takes five years, 10 years, or 20 years from now, these are things that still are possibilities to happen. So more articles on the world trade failing developing nations and losing their uh, special treatment around the world. And uh, just to mention here, these small developing nations did at some point say, you know what, we want our voices to be heard. They had a special uh, arrangement called the Doha Development Round where they said, we'll talk about these things, we'll try to fix it, we'll try to do better. Uh, 10 years, nothing. The larger countries uh, are saying that uh, this is never gonna happen. We're never gonna make these changes. We benefit from certain things and we're not willing to 
address some of these problems. And so uh, uh, even in uh, the rest of the Caribbean, they have talked about this rule-based multilateral trading system, which basically does not work out for small economies in the Caribbean. This was a recent statement by our Chief Negotiator Chicago Lang, where he talked about um, the Bahamas getting involved, and he mentions that he cannot mention most of the things that are involved inside this particular agreement at this point in time. So we don't even have the complete facts. We also know that they had had to consent a lot more of the areas that they were trading before. So there are different areas of the economy. Some of them are reserved for Bahamians. But a part of getting into this organization, you have to negotiate how much of these industries you want to give up. And what we have found is that we have had to give up more areas than before in order to comply to what they think is a good deal. And so here we are, kind of, these are the added areas of services, and you can look this up, uh, that we are basically offering to the world. And so uh, I put this in here because I had also spoken to some doctors, but it also affects uh, your healthcare, your form, and your regulations through the country. So this was the, the they did a study about the U.S. and how the uh, rounds were affecting uh, things that were happening there and affecting how they did healthcare in their country and was restricting certain things from happening and why it was so expensive for healthcare in America had to do with some of the policies that they had signed onto in terms of the WTO. You're seeing something in there, but. Um, so that is kind of like a bit of an overview of where we are in terms of the WTO. It's a trading organization, we're trying to get in, and we're giving up parts of our economy in order to get into this organization. And so we all need to be fully aware of what's going on and what's happening. I just mentioned a little note about our group, the voice of the people, because we feel like we need to have a vision for our country and a path that we can lay out rather than just accepting uh, this particular deal as an all in all, this international deal, but we need to have a vision for our country and we, we know where we're going to and we have an economic plan. And so I'm gonna hand over to Chris and let him get into some of this information.